welcome back to the Firehouse Chronicles with Matt Spinks. Um, a lot of you guys know we've been doing some interview kind of conversational podcast this year in 2024. So just excited to uh, have my buddy Kip Gibbons on today, or actually it's tonight. We're recording on a Friday evening. Kip's given us a little bit of his Friday evening as uh, you'll see he has quite a, uh, and if you don't already know Kip, he's quite, he's got quite the whiskey collection there. He's also a, uh, a, an educator on the on the subject of all things whiskey so we'll probably chat a little bit about that as well but um i'm excited to have kip on and uh and and just to talk you know wh what i've been having this year in these conversational podcasts is uh having people on that i've known for at least 10 years that have just loved the gospel consistently they've been resting in the finished work enjoying jesus um you know enjoying life from a grace perspective and who, you know, they've had a, a healthy, stable family life, you know, although we all experience ups and downs, but, you know, that they've been uh, just, you know, loving the gospel and seeing fruit in their life, whether they, you know, uh, whatever background, whatever place they may be coming from. So we've just been doing those conversations. So I just love to introduce Kip to you guys. Kip and his wife, Dana, live in Nebraska. And uh, Kip works in the whiskey world, but he also loves theology. And so thanks for joining, bro. Really appreciate you. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. It's a privilege. Yeah, it's, it's going to be fun. So so uh, for those that don't know you, some people tuning in will already have you know known you from, say, the, the whiskey retreats with John Crowder, gospel whiskey retreats, um, the gentlemen's uh, retreats in, in Kentucky and in, uh, in the UK. Um, but you're, you have a kind of a, a ministry that you call the Happy Reformers as well and uh so maybe tell us a little bit about that like what's your heart behind, behind starting something called happy reformers and uh, why why did you choose that and what do you see as being reformed in this uh in this day and age yeah so um Big you know <laughs> yeah a little backstory so um actually next week i'll be 54 years old but i was born and raised in my Come pk on. Uh, yeah, I'm a PK, so I was, you know, been in church my entire life. Um, my dad had planted a church in the early 80s, um, kind of a, in those days, non-denominational, but we were kind of heavily driven on the prophetic movement. Uh, it's a, it was a little different yeah. than it is today. Um, we'll get into that maybe. But um, like my dad went to school with Bill Hammond who was one of the kind of the leading guys back in the day of church history and the early prophetic movement and stuff like that. So we, we see all a lot of that kind of stuff. And then, you know, through that time, I did a lot of uh, just traditional church ministry. Um, it was, I would say when I see and talk to other people and other friends of mine, I mean, it was still a, a healthy church, even though obviously our theology wasn't maybe where I would be today. Um, but it was, you know, we had, we went through those, those phases, but then, and I was a part and I led when I was in youth ministry, I was ordained when I was 21 and was on full-time staff at 21. Um, went through, I mean, I've been to Toronto when was the, the Toronto blessing. I went to um, Brownsville uh, but prior to that was at Rodney Howard Brown used to hang out in St. Louis. So my family, I'm, I'm born and raised in the St. Louis area. So that's home. That's where the, my dad's church was. So Rodney used to hang out there for a long time. Yeah, you, you saw Rodney in the early 90s? Yes. Oh, yeah. Back That's in the right. early heydays. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, been to Smithton, you know, which kind of an outpouring of the after the Brownsville and, and or, or Toronto, I guess it was pre-Brown. Anyway, um, you know, yeah. again, I didn't get to go to this one, but I mean, watched used to watch Todd Bentley online, you know, I mean, all. all yeah. So that was kind of that heritage um and and i love all those and 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 i um i honor them for what they were even though i look back and i don't know that i agree theologically with any of them um yeah yeah for but sure. there is also something to be said about presence and yes. uh they were they were definitely formative uh in the late 90s went through um a situation where uh, a lot of my church pastoral friends um, just completely turned their back on me. So I went through a divorce um, and, you know, 
that's been, you know, again, many years ago, there was some, and there were some challenges there. It wasn't just because, you know, the toothpaste cap didn't get put on and we couldn't get along. I mean, there was, there was some actual uh, abuse and things taking place towards myself, but more importantly, towards uh, my two kids. Uh, and it came sure. to a point where finally I had to do that. And I, through that process, I gained full custody of two kids in the late nineties as a man. So that'll give you a little bit of insight into kind of how that situation may have transpired. Uh, and that's not to throw shade. I mean, that's still my, those kids, mom and, and all that stuff. And they're both raised in a, I mean, my oldest son is, he'll be 30 this year. He's married, got three daughters. My daughters will be 26. So She's cool. married out of the house. Um, but during that process, I, let me yeah. give you a, a quick pause. People may not appreciate this, but I'm going to try to see if I can dig it up is the old, old photos of you from that era. Um, nice. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Somehow, because if you if so if you see Kip today and you see him back in the in the nineties when he was serving on staff at you know full time and yeah. uh he's got the slick back hair and the and the wire rim glasses and the full suit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's yeah, been quite a uh, transformation. But... <laughs> they're interesting, yeah, to say the least. Um anyway, go, go. <laughs> so I went through a, a change um my church supported me because they obviously had some knowledge of the situation. Anyway, went through sabbatical, all kinds of stuff. We had outside elders uh, that were pastors of other churches in other states that kind of oversaw uh, being an independent, non-denominational church. Anyway, after a period of time, um, so we were part of a network of churches. And like I said, those churches, I mean, I'd preached in their pulpits. I'd done baptismal services and their baptisms for their youth. I was in charge of the youth of these like 27 churches that we'd kind of networked in our area. And when that whole thing went down, they all turned their back on me. And, um, yeah, that's crazy. and I remember growing up in the church going, people always talking about, you know, the hypocrites or the churches. And I would always defend it because that was, and I believed it because I was in it. And then this happened. And, uh, that was the beginning of kind of changing my course. I never abandoned God. I never went off and did anything stupid or anything like that. I was a single dad and uh, raised two kids by myself for six years uh, until I met my wife, Dana, who we have 20 years next uh, in March. Um, yeah, congrats, man. Awesome. Yeah. And so, but during that time, and then when my, my dad was going to retire, I'd been brought back into ministry. He was going to retire, offered me the church. I was like, mm. I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Um, right. I was like, well, let's, you know, this yeah. is again, late nineties into the early two thousands. So I was like, well, let's do something different. Let's, so we did like the coffee house thing. Right. You know, I mean, not every, every good young, you know, yeah. We've pastor, got youth pastor in the day had to have a coffee house at some point in their ministry. Um, and so we hosted a lot of bands. I did music um, and it was fine. And it was that I, I kind of went on a journey back in those days of, uh, what was titled then the emergent church movement um, yeah. with some, 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 some individuals. And I kind of relate it to today. It, it, it's a similar path of the emergent church in the, in the early 2000, late 90s to kind of the, the deconstruction movement of today. And yeah. Yeah, without, I... without offending anyone, it, it was, it's kind of, and, cause I was there. So that I say this not as a, I say it from somebody who walked through that it was an outlet yeah. to still have your faith, but kind of be a dick um, and yeah. just be critical and carry offense and look for the flaws, point out the flaws, talk about all the things that were wrong in the church because we were operating out of wound. Right. Um, so my wife, my Dana, was here in Nebraska. She lived here. Uh, we met in St. Louis, uh, one of the little, little side ventures. I kind of had some business stuff. I owned a tattoo shop for a few years. Um, and she was doing an internship of all places at Joyce Myers Dream Center in St. Louis. And Oh, I didn't know that. That's my uh, And she walked into yeah. the tattoo shop one night. And um, six months later, we were married. And like I said, that's been 20 years ago. Um, but her cool. home church here in Nebraska uh, was an Assembly of God church. Uh, he was the presbyter here in the state. Um, they were, they had just gotten tied into this group that I'd never heard of. Cause I'd, I'd kind of walked away from more of the charismatic style stuff. Cause I was doing the, 
and it was this group called Bethel. <laughs> I never heard of them. Oh. And, and so they were part of, um, they were, they had Joaquin who was at the time in charge of their healing rooms, who now has a path, has a, has a church there in Austin, who's doing great things. Yeah. Uh, and Joaquin's a great dude. Yeah. One of our mutual friends, Warren Sylvester is actually leading worship for a conference there nice. next week. Um, with a guy by the yeah. name of Jeff Collins, who yeah. was also a friend of ours back here. So kind of some fun things there. But, right. Yeah. So that was the schedule kind of like the end of this particular week. And um, Stephen Mel, the pastors, they're little short people. I mean, they're like four foot 10. I mean, they're like little tiny people, not, not literally, but they are short, yeah. but fiery. And Melanie, Melanie is like, I've heard, I've seen this guy on YouTube. I heard something's going on. And if God's doing something, we need to be involved. So they were having him in on Monday and Tuesday prior to the Bethel team coming in that weekend. And they'd had the Bethel team in for a couple of years already every year. Well, this guy's name was John Crowder. And oh um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I show up, uh, my wife and I, the kids, and here's this guy. And this was back in the, you know, the early days with the long goatee, you know, the shaved head, kind of, right. that, you know, the, the new mystics uh, book, things of that nature. And I didn't know what to expect. I had no, I'd never heard of him. Didn't have anything of you. I mean, I didn't know, but I was so out of the loop from what the experiences, the charismatic or supernatural yeah. or any of that kind of stuff. I had kind of just stepped away because I'd become kind of cynical towards just a general sense of things. And as soon as he gets up, so they sang a song the end of their the worship set and it was a popular song at the time and it was by somebody from ihop and first thing he does is he gets up and he's like listen that song is horrible horrible theology because <laughs> it was about this you know distance and delay groaning longing and all this kind of stuff and i'm like what is what is why, who is this guy uh anyway i just connected and then he praying for people and he's doing and all of a sudden what what actually happened with that encounter was that realm, there was something on the inside that stirred me again. Come on. And I'm not saying that the supernatural in and of itself is the gospel. I'm not saying we seek experience, but I believe that is absolutely a hundred percent part of the gospel and part of our experience in salvation. And again, I, like I said, I, I've been to all the, I mean, I grew up in that Rodney Hart Brown and, and the, the, all those movements, revivals, whatever you want to call them. And I, I'm sitting there in that meeting, those two meetings. And I was like, my spirit was like, you remember this? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. Come this on. is home. This is home. Come on. And so, Dude. and then you know, later that week, Joaquin was there, obviously lots of healings and stuff like that. That was their kind of, and it, it, all of a sudden it shifted my paradigm once again, but not yeah. back just to the old mentality. I was like, I was caught by this is home. This is real. This experience has legs to it. Now I need to find the legs. Yeah. That's good. Um, got to know John, started watching your early Firehouse Chronicles when you were sitting on the couch, you know, I mean, back in the day, yeah. it was just eight, yeah. 2008, you know, ish or something like that. Um, and uh, anyway, so that put me on a journey. We did a, um, so we did a, a church plant. It's more of a house church. So I was doing it and I said, so the happy reformers, I, that's a really long answer to come back all the way full circle no. to the happy reformers. And as I was still progressing and learning that journey, as I still am, um, obviously the happy part simply came from, you know, the, just the old tired religion. If there's one thing that I truly do honor and I, he's even changed a little bit. Um, but like those early days of Rodney Howard Brown, I mean, that, yeah. that was the first time in a church setting in those times where I was just like, I mean, this dude was happy and people are laughing. Yeah. yeah. Crying. And, and, and I don't, you know, I don't care about, you know, oh, some people were probably faking or eh, probably, I mean, you know, whatever. Um, but there was like, genuineness yeah. there as well. And, and I was like happy. And so I started to, and then this one verse, first Timothy one eleven, in the rather Pam translation says proclaiming the glad message of the happy God. And I was wow. like, Ooh, that's good. So the happy thing I just, I wanted to put in there because I was like, man, this is so many people view church and religion and all those things as just this, 
you know, boom, boom, you got to do the rules, got to follow all the, it's the list of don'ts and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, man, there's so much more to the gospel, to this experience yeah. than that. And it's actually, I've come to give you life and give you that more abundantly, not just abundantly, yes. but more abundantly beyond what you can <laughs> ask or think, you know, take a moment and just get out of your head for a moment and think the most outrageous thoughts you can about a good God. Yeah. Yes. And it doesn't even come close to what he actually is. We can't even begin to comprehend what that's like. Um, and so then the reformer part, um, you know, just kind of came, I think of the reformation and I, I'm, I'm a student of history. I love history. Uh, I love whiskey history. Yeah. I love church history. I love just world history. You know, I, I love to, I, I read two types of books. I don't read a lot of novels. Uh, I'm not against those. I just, it's just not really my, maybe it's, maybe sometimes it'd be good to decompress, but I don't have time for that. I'm re always reading something that's educational. Um, but I read yeah. history books, whiskey books, and theology books. Um, right. And, <laughs> but I was like, I, I love history. And so, as you know, you start to go back and you, you then you you dig into church history and then you dig back into the fathers, the church fathers and, and all these things. And the world begins to open. And then you see exposition by guys like Karl Barth and the Torrance brothers. And then, of course, modern people like our, our mutual friends, you know, John Crowder has has been a huge influence in my life for 15 years. Um, you know, Dr. Yeah. Baxter Kruger, you know, and and, and many others um, that have, have come along the way. And I was like, the church needs a new reformation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, with Luther, Luther, the thing that people I think miss about the, the, the reformation, the Protestant reformation is Luther did not set out to start a new religion or a new denomination. He was wholeheartedly exactly. in to the Catholic church. He loved mother church with everything that was a part of him. But he also yeah. saw the problems, and those problems had grown to a point where he was like, this has got to change. So, of course, you know, the 95 Thesis, et cetera, et cetera. And so the Reformation took place. I think the church today is in the same form. Back in those, those days of my deconstruction or my emergent church, you know, we were ready to just blow up the church. Right. But that's not the answer. Which you saw some of that in the Reformation of Luther's day too. You know, with the, you know, the, the Luther's the, one of the more famous ones, but there's a hundred other reformers from that period yeah. that somewhat were, you know, even killing, you know, and, and right, just starting over it and whatnot. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so I do believe that the church, quote, as a whole, the church, and particularly the Western church, needs a reformation, a reformation of thinking. Um, and for me, what that really at least honed in on my perspective and kind of where I kind of flow uh, is, number one, the a reformation in the idea of grace, radical grace, hyper grace. Let's take it all in. Because, again, I grew up in church. I heard the word grace probably every week. Yeah, but it was the most it was the lamest word we could use. I know it's, it, it yeah. had no yeah. meaning. It was, well, it's, it's unmerited favor. And it was just, it was this, it, grace was almost like this pity thing. Like God pities us, so he gives us grace. And, yeah. and grace yeah. is so much more than that. Uh, and then tied in with that is, of course, the finished works message um, that Jesus actually accomplished something. Um, he didn't come yeah. out to give us the law 2.0. He didn't come to give us a tool book so that we could now fulfill the law, that we could now do all the stuff. Uh, he literally came to completely revolutionize, to change our thinking, to change the delusion, yeah. the illusions that we had of him. And... So, you know, that, 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 that finished works, the, the, that to me is, is something that the church still needs, is still growing in and needs to grasp. And, and then the, the third thing that for me is kind of important, well, there are two more. One is, again, identity, uh, which they kind of tie together. I, I'm a big guy on, yeah. I, I love to talk and speak into people's identity, because again, we have an identity crisis in the church. 
well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, Matt. I mean, I'm like, I right. used to get into it with my mom as I got through this stuff, you know, and she would say that. I'm like, mom, you can't, that's not true. Well, what do you mean that's not mom. true? I'm like, listen, let's even take, let's just dumb it down. Okay. You were a sinner. Okay. You have been saved. Right. You can't be both anymore. <laughs> and you don't fall in and out of salvation any more than my children fall in and out of my favor. And, and, and so uh, identity is a big one. You know, what we are, what Jesus is, what Jesus has said we, we are. Uh, and then the other yeah. is um, going into like that Hebrews 4 thing is the rest. Come um, on, bro. The church, the church I grew up in, the church that I've been a part of, the church that I've seen for so many years uh, is just always striving and always working. And if you're not, you know, if your hands aren't bloodied and you're not exhausted, then you're just not doing enough for God. And, you know, again, scripture, yeah. I think, tells us there's a better way. And it's entering into the rest Come on. of what's finished. And again, the misconception is, well, you're just telling people to be lazy. No, not at all. Um, right. <laughs> it, it's like the whole thing with the hyper grace. You know, well, you're just giving people license to sin. I'm like, you guys are, I have to watch well, my language. A, you know? I don't know all your no. listeners, but like, it, it's such a, yeah. an ignorant, and I mean that in its, its sense, it's an unknowing statement. Listen, if I'm in love, I want to please I want to be, and I want to do. It's not about when, when I understand that I'm no longer a sinner, that's this and sin in scripture. We always, again, the church I grew up in sin was always the verb sins, you know, right. well, this, 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 you're living in sin. And that's not what sin is scripturally. Right. I mean, hamartia sin is this an entity, this nature that ruled us. Paul talks about that in Ephesians. And through our death, burial, and resurrection, co-death, burial, and resurrection with Jesus, that nature has been put under. You are now a new, neos new, a completely new redesigned creature. And when we understand that, then everything changes. So now sin isn't something that I'm trying to hide from. Sin doesn't on, have bro. an allure. I don't want to sin. Yeah. What does sin have that 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 the presence of Jesus doesn't have? It's a it, 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 it's a weak alternative. Um, exactly, and the same thing with Love rest. It. Because I'm not striving, I'm actually free to do the work because I'm not focused on the work. It's a natural result of who I am. You know, if yeah. I find a new, if I find a new whiskey that I like and it's brand new yeah. and nobody's heard of it, what am I going to do? Am I going to hide it or am I going to tell people, hey, have you heard about this? Hey, have you heard about yeah, that? Exactly. Oh, you it's really good. It's Come the on. same thing. I'm Dude, not a salesman it. for them, but I'm doing it naturally because I've, I've found something that I'm like, oh, this is really good. You should try this. And it's the same thing when it comes to evangelism or those works. We do it not because we feel like we're trying to check off some list any longer, because it's just the natural outflow of who we are. I understand, or I understand the goodness of God. I want to invite people to participate into that because it is beyond understanding. I'm not trying to get yeah. them to say a prayer or come to my church or do any of those things. I'm just like, have you heard Come on, bro. that you're included, that you're there, <laughs> you know? Yes. So. Uh, oh, well, you're well, speaking my language, man. You, that, you, as you know, there you go. What are you, what are you drinking there? <laughs> I'm actually drinking. Uh, this has been holiday. Uh, they're out of Missouri, outside of Kansas city. Um, they're fairly, a fairly new, newer whiskey brand, but all they do is bottled and bond stuff. And it's phenomenal. It's really good. And, and and he demonstrates the word right there, you know. That's right, exactly. <laughs> no, it's cool, man. You know, it, it, I mean, obviously, you're speaking my language. These are things, and, and I'm so thankful that there's more and more folks just just you know, firstly enjoying it, and then and then speaking right. that, you know, sharing that because 
you know, a reformation like this does, it, it, it takes a while. Um, it takes a lot of, you know, uh, teamwork and just people that are, you know, I mean, it, well, in, in one sense, it's kind of, it is effortless because it, it, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And the truth is more powerful than the lies. You right. know? Um, but there's still a lot of resistance towards this. And I think almost everything you said, there's, you know, there's theological books written through church history that, I mean, some would support what you're saying, especially from the early church. You read Athanasius and Irenaeus right. and you get bogged down in, uh, you know, especially in the last thousand years of church history, there's just reams of, theological writing on you are a sinner you're by nature unclean like you right you know right uh it's all about you 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 even though the you know the reformation it as capon said is when men <laughs> went blind staggering drunk at the fact that we were home before we started and that it was exactly grace from i got that quote pulled up right here <laughs> yeah oh, exactly yeah yeah but it's like, like you said, our, our definition of grace has been this uh, very stale kind of stoic uh, theological term. And I think a lot of times it's just because we never saw it demonstrated in a way. It's like so many of our concepts of God have been reserved for these high church, very separate from everyday life type of scenarios. And, you know, you, what, what I love, you're sharing about the rest, for example, you know, what, what a lot of us in church just never, uh, we just failed to see for so many years is that what if God just wants us to enjoy our life with our family and our kids and, and you know, just enjoying a, a, a beautiful, blessed life where it yep. isn't about all of these things that we're uh, like paranoid that we're not doing enough. And, right. and right. so it's just hard to see a few people getting this message and living in rest with their family and they're not like all stressed out and they're, you know, the sin issues are getting resolved. It, it's like you, you can, you have a different grid for what grace could even be, you right. know, and there's a, a picture that, you know, and so that's why I'm thankful too to just, you know, even to keep having conversations with guys like you, because I've been to your house and I've seen you, you how you live with your family and just the, that you're enjoying your life and, and uh, yeah, you have all these whiskeys, but you're not hammered drunk every night and avoiding right. your, your your family. And it, you, it's like you've found this integrated life filled with just the simple joys that, you know, I, I think we all know that that's, you know, it, it resonates real easily with people. But somehow in the in the milieu of church, you know, that we've lost that so many times for for this 100 it, it, even if you're, you don't think of it as commandments, but just these hundred busy things that we're supposed to be doing, right? Instead of just an integrated, normal, everyday life, uh, enjoying God and enjoying the people around us, you know. So, yeah, there's a context to it, and uh, right. the well, restful think, life is part of it, you know. <laughs> well, and for me, I think one of the one of the, the the paradigm shifts that happened during this journey for me growing up the way that I did in, in church culture and again, popular church culture is always the gospel, which again, the gospel, I mean, you know, if you're, you're Calvinist or you've got your reformed Baptists and you've got even your Armenian non, like there's this legal understanding. Yeah. And everything is transactional and everything is legal. Right. Even when we, we boil it down to the whole of God. Right. And that's exactly what I'm going to say. It grew up yeah. with that image of the courtroom, um, not only where Jesus was trying to defend us against the Father, you know, and all that BS, but just this idea that that, that God is 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 even He doesn't His only residence is on the throne, and it's this court, you know. And a shift changed for me when I began to view. I was like, listen, heaven is not a courtroom; it's a family room. Come on, bro. Come on. And I think of, you know, listen, if, if we would get out of our heads again, sometimes some of the great lessons I can learn about God in, in, in very small ways is by just taking a look at myself and my family. When I look at my children, 
Do I want certain things for my children? Of course I do. Do I want them to succeed? Do I want them to be happy? Do I want them to enjoy their lives? Do I, do I have, do we have certain standards that I think are, are appropriate along their path? Absolutely. But Come on. inevitably they're going to miss some of those things. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, exactly. blatantly. But you know what? I don't then, you know, it's like, and, and, and you know, it, it sounds extreme, but I think if we would, again, if we would step back a minute, the gospel that we've heard is pretty extreme in a bad way. If, if I've told my, I've told my kids, I mean, I told them not to touch the stove when I'm cooking. I tell them when I'm in the kitchen, right. don't come to the stove. It's yeah. hot. It's it, don't do it. it. I'm telling you, this is a command. Don't do that. And then when my my child comes up and touches the stove, if we're if we present that as the God that we were taught, then all of a sudden the, the child comes up, touches the stove, hurts themselves because there is a consequence to an action that God then all of a sudden turns his back and said, I told you not to do that. And until you tell right. me you're sorry, you're going to sit there and your fingers are going to burn off. I mean, how right. even more, I'm going to burn you even more on there. <laughs> right. <laughs> Like we just haven't thought through a lot of this stuff, honestly. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that just, and that's that, that, you know, God is holy. He can't look upon sin. Like, like sin somehow is greater than God or his, if God is the author, the creator and sustainer of all things, then all of those things come under his submission. There's no thing Come greater. On. You know, we know yes. that there is no such thing as darkness. It is simply the absence of light. Yes. We know that we talk about sin and we talk about disobedience. We know those things. Listen, we, we can disobey. I get it. I've disobeyed. I still disobey sometimes. It, it's less and less all the time. But, you know, there are moments you, 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 you whatever, you, you don't follow that leading yeah. and, and, and whatever. You can, that's disobeying, in my opinion. Yeah. But at the same time, none of that stuff carries the weight that we thought it did. The father has invited us into the family room to jump up on his lap or maybe come on to use a, a, a maybe maybe just to sit and play a game or watch TV and maybe we're not even worshiping God or do but we're right. there's that there's that union there's that togetherness <laughs> because the family room is relational. And I think even though the church we've grown up talking about, you know, we're not talking about religion, even the religious people. I'm talking about religion, we're talking about a relationship with God. I don't know that we, you know, yeah. it's kind of like the prince's bride. We step. keep using that word, but I don't think you know what that word means. You know, I don't even understand what relationship actually means. Relationship is relational. And it is this mutual other giving thing. And I think you know, uh, Baxter has, has one that kind of, I think the first person that I, I read and, and, and then have heard, but this idea of being invited into the triune family of God, the dance, the walk, right? And that's what, to me, that's what the faith experience, that's what Christianity is, because yes. Jesus accomplished something, and he didn't accomplish something to save us from the Father, or even uh, to 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 cover something, He came as a direct representative of the Father's desire. Come on, bro. Jesus wasn't coming to give us an out or an in to the Father. He was coming to change the delusion that we had made that God was something that he wasn't. Yes. And he came to show us, I am showing you what the father is like. You know, again, nobody's seen the father except me. Or if you've seen the father, you've seen me. I do nothing except what I see the father do. We, we talk those things, but if we, we think them through, Come that on, union is so together they are in sync and yeah and i think you know that, that's again one of those reformation points is that you know 
Jesus is God. But like it's 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 this the union that Father, Son, and Spirit exhibit together that everything, every reference that we have of one member of the Trinity is representative of all of them, all yep. three. And and they work in unison. You know, it's the 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 one with three distinct one with distinction, right? And Love the it. idea that we that if we can look at Jesus and then through that see the Father, because again, you know, you go back to uh, you know Genesis right three Genesis three Adam Eve the garden the apple the whole fruit whatever. Oh yeah, and God, you know, that's when God turned His back on man. That's where we get a lot of that theology. You know, we have a Genesis three theology. And my question is to people, okay, but do you still believe that God knows everything? Is God still omnipresent, omniscient, all these things? So he wasn't surprised by anything. Forget the totality of time before, but even in that moment, he wasn't surprised. Yeah. But if you take your understanding that uh, his holiness can't stand the sight of sin, then why did he still show up in the, the cool of the day for his evening walk? Right. Yeah, exactly. He, he never abandoned them. Why? Come on. Why we're hiding? Well, why are you hiding? He knew. Yeah. It wasn't like he was trying to get information. He was trying right. to show them. Hey, okay. Look. Oh well, we're we're, we're naked. Who told you you were naked? Like Come. this whole thing of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is something that we weren't to participate in, partake of, because that's really the result of where we live today. All of that. And he never abandoned yeah. them. You know, Paul says yep. that we were enemies of God in our minds. We weren't actual That's enemies it. of God. We've never been the enemy of God. Just Come like on. my children can never be my enemy, regardless of what they do. We've never been the enemies of God. What we've done is we've created an image of God in our head and built walls and made yeah. a God in our own, yes, our own image, but we've made God out of our own weakness, our own fears, our own uh, inabilities, our own frailties. And we projected this image and decided that that was God because we felt that about ourselves. Come on, and man. Jesus came to do away with that, to change our thinking that we've always been the beloved. So you know, good. So. The prodigal didn't get forgiveness when he came back on the ranch. Exactly. In man. fact, I would argue that the father, forgiveness never even crossed the father's mind. Yeah. He was never offended to begin with. Exactly. <laughs> um. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, love, I think you are touching on some of the keys, bro, of, you know, just what, you know, unconditional love is a lot of what you're talking about. You know, if God really is love, we've had so many twisted pictures of that. And we're like, well, God's ways are higher than our ways. And so therefore we define God's love in some way worse than the right. love of a father to a, to a child, you know? And so it, you know, even even in our holiness definitions, I love how Baxter says holiness is a, meant to be a relational word. When they're saying holy, 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 it says they're, you know, staring into each other's eyes and, and right. enjoying relation. Now we, you know, we through Christ are participating in that relationship that uh, of the God that never left us and that never will leave us. And even though there, you know, there are a lot of scriptures that we don't yet understand, or we haven't been able to synthesize, or maybe we've been taught poorly. Sometimes the translations just straight up poorly. Although I'm not one of those guys that believes the, the scriptures all lost to translation. I, I think you know the, the the important things have been preserved there, but sure. we just misinterpret for so long that. Yeah, our, our view of salvation is a courtroom and our view of God is primarily as judge and yep. our, our view of holiness is about rules. And and so 
it really is refreshing, man, to to come back to something that I think does, you know, he's put eternity in our hearts. It resonates. When you start to share this, it resonates, though people can't quite explain it. Maybe you haven't been able to, you know, get your theological ducks in a row yet, but your heart knows God is love and that love right. can't do abandonment. And that, you know, if right. we're in a family, supposed to be healthy not easily offended you know and yeah. so well, these and are think powerful about, things. yeah we talk about being like god right i mean at the church i just want to be like god i want to be like jesus i want to be like god right because we we have the verses you know be holy as i am holy be perfect all these things and we, we even though i think those are we've translated those wrongly poorly but right here's the thing it's this cycle when we don't have relationship all we have is this mental assent to something. So yeah. if we primarily think that God is a judge, guess what comes out of us? Judgment. Absolutely. Exactly. Yes. Come on. Yeah. And when we begin to change and realize that Father, Son, and Spirit have together combined through the act of Jesus to reconcile the cosmos to himself and that there is yes. nothing but love. When we Come begin on. to start to fathom that, then all of a sudden we begin to view things, look at things, look at people all through that lens. Yes. And again, goes back to the rest. All of a sudden, we're not striving for something. We're not trying to produce. We're just being imitators of God. Come on. So good. It's so good, man. Yeah, I I, I appreciate it, man. And I, I think you, you, you mentioned earlier um, about deconstruction. And it's interesting that you were a part of the emergent uh, kind of scene back in those early days. It's funny, I, it, it, obviously there's nothing new under the sun. This is what's been happening over and over a lot. So many cycles repeat themselves. And, you know, it's it's funny. What I've found in a lot of deconstruction groups is like there's kind of two, there's kind of two ways you can go with it, or probably more than that. But uh, there, there's some that end up getting angry about it, you know, and, and just then, like you said, wanting to burn everything down. And honestly, there is some anger when you've been lied to for so long, you know? Sure. Um, but then I think there's another side that's, that's just genuinely like saying, you know what, this stuff just doesn't, doesn't work. And either way, you know, I, I've grown to appreciate it because, and like, like all of us in a way that is kind of a reformation, you know, the, the thing is, is if you just don't like stop and kind of, I mean, there's gotta be hope, right. And there's gotta be, right. So, something better it's it's like there's so many folks that love to watch the game but are, are you actually in the game like making changes you know it's like we all like to be the armchair quarterback that says what everybody's right. doing wrong thing but then okay buddy but like if you just saying the whole world is sucks and the whole church sucks and let's give up on it I, but and i think some people do end up that way and maybe that's you know where they're going to be for a, a season or for some time um but I think a lot of what we're talking about here really is deconstruction in a way, but it's, I think you want to be led by the spirit and, and then into what are the things that are timeless? What are the things that, that Jesus reconstructed, you know, right. what are the differences between that, that thing that became so sick and something that could be healthy and something that is, you know, ultimately life giving, you know? Sure. So, so yeah, deconstruction, it's like, it could be a, a it's such a it's a buzzword right now um yes and, but i think you know jesus said metanoia right if if it's positive sense it just becomes metanoia in a, sure. a return to like um like bart said semper reformanda like the church is always reforming and, and i think that's because we're all still awakening to the fullness <laughs> of the gospel you know so um yeah you know every, every generation has had uh, some awful mistakes that we've made as the church and hopefully, you know, our deconstruction can become a, a positive metanoia. Um, and, you know, and hopefully we do learn some things. I, I'm thankful as you look throughout church history, there are times when something gets just rooted into the body of Christ and it's passed on. 
And I think we've touched on some of those tonight that we're hoping will be passed <laughs> on the goodness of God, you know, unconditional right. love, God as father, you know, being included in Trinitarian life, uh, the experience of the presence, the tangible presence, you know, right. Uh, hopefully these things are getting rooted and we're removing the judgment and the fear and, you know, this, the striving and those things can cease um but yeah it's it, a lot of people are talking about this stuff yeah and uh it's good conversations to have as long as we're we look back to jesus um we need a savior we need a lord right and uh he had to do with that religious bs that we are a part of you know he's like <laughs> i didn't i didn't want to be in those services either buddy <laughs> yeah, right exactly yes he he, en he endured those as well <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so <laughs> That's cool. Man. Well, um, I'd love to let people know, you know, you have some books that you've written and so, some stuff that you're doing. You you have uh, you're, you're also doing videos on a regular basis on YouTube. And um, you said you're writing a book on Galatians right now. Is that something that I, you're still working? I am. Yeah, I've got I, I I've got about, about that. one about one chapter, I think. I think okay. I got okay. one chapter left uh, and then just some finishing touches throughout it. Um Galatians has always been, even, even before my own reformation and my own, you know, paradigm shift into the gospel and radical oh, grace okay. and all those things. I've always loved Galatians for, for it's always had an allure to me. Um, and so now I look at Galatians, um, you know, and again, of course, I mean, Romans is fantastic. I love, you know, especially five, six, you know, those are great points for some of the stuff we're talking about in a new reformation. Um, second Corinthians five is phenomenal. You know, there's great stuff. I love the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is awesome. Yeah. Um, you still but, Bible. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I love, I love all four of the epistles of, of Paul, but I love Galatians or the letters. I love Galatians. Um, and I think the thing that, that strikes me and part of it is, um, where I, we've been uh, throughout my quote unquote faith journey and all those types of things. Uh, and it resonates more and more. Uh, part of it is a personality thing. You know, I, I think I also believe that God's given every one of us a personality and we are drawn to certain types of things. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I think, again, diversity in the body of Christ is a good thing. Um, and we're all unique and, 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 and all have different perspectives and, and gifts and talents and all those things that we talk about. But we also all have different just personality types and, and things that kind of, you know, stroke us. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but like the things that just kind of excite us and get us going. And I think those are God given. And so I Come love on. Galatians because I just love the way Paul treats that situation. And, 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 and especially now with, with where I am currently and way, how I understand the gospel, here's, here's Paul goes into Galatia, plants this church. He's there, you know, and, and he just, he just pours into them the gospel. I mean, and again, Paul, Paul makes some pretty outrageous statements in his writings. Like God gave me the gospel. Right. Excuse me. I mean, yes. I that's, gospel. that's pretty ballsy. Um, yeah. and, and then he, so he plants and he, he just goes and goes and goes and he feeds and feeds. And what we find through the book of Galatians is what he fed them was radical grace, freedom from the law. Come on. And all of a sudden he goes away. And, you know, depending on some of the narratives that, that one believes, I mean, some people can cite some historical evidence. There's, you know, various things, um, you know, my personal belief, I'm not going to die on this hill, but I do believe that, you know, once he left that some of the, 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 the law guys from Jerusalem did come in and follow after him and we're sowing yeah. discord and we're trying to upend again, this radical message. And the reason it was radical, number one, because obviously it was, it was talking about the goodness of God and that God had done everything, but it also upended their system. Yeah. And, and so when Paul writes back to the Galatians and, and from what we gather historically uh, in all of the new Testament, Galatians was the first book of what we have in, in the canon of the scriptures, the first book written. 
Um, and it was definitely Paul. So even the, the, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all proceeded from or after Paul's early letters. And we know that Luke was a scribe for Paul. We know that John Mark traveled with him for a while. So there's, you know, all of these things. Anyway, um, but he writes back and he's going, you foolish, you know, some trend, you stupid Galatians. Who yeah. has be with you? Who has who has already caused you to turn from the gospel that you received and is trying yes. to again put you into bondage? Um, and I just I, I love that and I feel that on many levels. And so um it's it's kind of a weird but thing. That, you know, Say that, again? nothing like that, nothing like that happens today, you know. Right, right. Um, and so this book that I'm writing, the, the tentative title, we'll see what they say when I, you know, get to kind of do it if they don't think it's good, because sometimes I'm not the most creative when it comes to that kind of stuff. But it's my my working title is Letter to a Bewitched Church. Um, and it's kind of it. a commentary, but not a commentary in the sense of like, you know, an Adam Clark commentary, but it's, it's basically me going through the book of Galatians and then tying in scriptures and stuff and just, but kind of going somewhat verse by, not really, but kind of just going in a chronological order and, and just discussing some of those elements. And you, you know, you get obviously the, That's the, the, the witchment, you get uh, the law and grace heavy going into Abraham, going into the realm of the school teacher and, and, and the, 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 the inheritance and all these things that have huge impacts on what we believe about the gospel. Um, and then of course, you know, you come through all that, you know, again, you were, you were set free. Why? For some elevated high super spiritual reason. No, you were set free for freedom's sake, you know? Yes. And then, of course, you get into, obviously, caring for your brother and, you know, those types of things. And then what we call the fruit of the spirit. Um, yeah. And, you know, again, the fruit of the spirit is not like when I was growing up, I've heard sermons on the fruit of the spirit where, you know, it's almost like you were, you know, pardon the, the crudeness, but like you're sitting on the toilet. Exactly. And you're like trying to push one out like, I got to have more. <laughs> Oh, I've got to have more, all this. And it's like, no, it, it's fruit. Yeah. The, come the, on. the apple tree doesn't strive to produce apples. Yeah. It just does. Yeah. But it's, it's a byproduct of what it is. And the fruit of the spirit means that these are all what the spirit operates in. And it's what we are. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm Love. hoping, um, you know, and I know you've done some writing and I was hoping to have it done before the end of the year, but you know, it didn't happen. And so we're, we're on track, but yeah, I'm hoping to get it out, you know, the first part of this year, maybe, um, at least by mid year. Um, no, I'm excited, bro, because I think that it's, and it's especially, you know, poignant that you're, your ministry call is called the happy reformer is it writing on galatians because it's like i think that's probably the most relevant as far as kind of where the church seems to be at in so many ways that somebody's right. listening to this podcast you're like not quite sure about what we're talking about just read the book of galatians i mean it's in <laughs> right. there it, you know there's so many ways that we we thought we already understood grace and the gospel but you read the book of galatians and you're like we, I, maybe Paul would be like rebuking all, the entire church today to, to wake up to the fact that, right. you know, it doesn't end on us. I think, you know, and that, and that's uh, just, it really is one of the most liberating realities. And it's so, it's so refreshing and it's what helps you to live an integrated life because if you've actually already been set free, now you can pay attention to just your family, your job, your, your, even your hobbies, you can, you can actually give yourself to, you know, the things that you were so you were too worried about religious stuff before, you yeah. know, and I think that's, you know, we, we see all the ministry burnout, we see all the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the family issues at home from religious people. And, well, it's because their time and attention was always focused on chasing this invisible carrot. And right. they, they didn't wow. 
it already been set for you. You've already been made whole. Um, so you already have yeah. that carrot. What do you do when you, when you already got, you already got it. Yeah. Right. So, right. Yeah. Excited, bro. You know, we need to unpack this stuff. And if anybody's listening tonight, you know, we, and you, and you, you wanted to go deeper into these things, um, you know, hit, hit Kip up later, uh, hit, hit us up. We, we also recommend a lot of, you know, like a lot of the stuff we talked about tonight is stuff that Dr. C. Baxter Kruger touches on a lot. Right. Of course, Crowder and, Francois to toy a bunch of our friends yep. but um yeah it's just it's fun man fun to revelate yeah. in this stuff and, uh yes. yeah it's so good yeah cool. <laughs> Ooh, i don't know how long we went so far but i feel like it's probably probably pretty good i actually i should go get a glass and have a glass of whiskey with you on the on the podcast there you go there you but, go all right i've got me a proper whiskey <laughs> glass here and uh i just grabbed a bottle of aberfeldy 12 nice which uh, it's it's not a crazy good one but it's an everyday kind of right here that's right i like that's the right. Highland yeah show us your uh um, your recommendation yep. yeah what are you what I'm are you drinking again tonight the holiday uh bottled in bond bourbon bottom and bottom that's gonna be hot yeah yeah so it's hunter proof and i think this one is six years nice yep. so this is 12 but it, it in the in scotland they have to do it a bit longer don't they because uh yeah so well, i tell people I one of the things that you know and i love scotch and over you know been drinking whiskey for 30 years um scotch was where i started because american whiskey in that day wasn't what it is today by any means so i'm still a huge fan of scotch whiskey even though i, I deal more in american whiskey kind of with my livelihood um you live in america was, that's right but i always try to educate people and it's not a slam on scotch uh, at all again i love scotch and i'm actually scott heritage so like I, i'm all in but you know people are just like well you know some people are like, well, scotch is better because it's aged longer or they take that off. Oh, you know, American whiskey, the longer it's aged, the better it is. Because, I mean, look at what scotch does. And I'm like, there's some truth to that, but it's not a rule. Um, because in America, we have to go into new barrels, new charred oak barrels. Scotland doesn't. Scotland goes into used barrels. Um, uh -huh. And so I, I tell people the example of like coffee. Um, let's say you just have an old, you know, Black & Decker, Mr. Coffee Maker, right? You know, the old, just put the grounds in and pour the dump and it just drips, a drip maker. And, and you know, at least hopefully you're making it properly and you can't see through it. Um, but, you know, you got a nice <laughs> cup of coffee. Well, let's say you drink the whole pot and you still want some more, but you're cheap um, or lazy or whatever. And so instead yeah. of dumping the grounds and redoing it, you just fill the carafe with water, dump it back in and run it through those same grounds. Yeah. technically that's still coffee but the color <laughs> difference between those two is going to be drastically different the strength right. content is going to be drastically different because the first use gets more out of it now yeah. if i took the second one and i redid it through it again even though it'd be a third time but it was still had some of that, there's all sorts of nuances so you know on a good bottle of scotch probably like your aberfeldy there They'll say two things, a good bottle of single malt, non-chill filtered, no color added. Yep. The reason is yep. legally in Scotland, they can add up to uh, it's 0.02% of E150 caramel coloring. The reason they're allowed to by law is because even a 12, 15, 20 year scotch can still have less color than a four, six year old bourbon because it's going into used barrels. And so a lot of those distillers are said, one of the reasons they highlight no color added is because they're letting people know that even though we're allowed to, by law, we're not. I can put a, a four-year-old bourbon against a, my, you know, 12-year McKellen and the bourbon's got more color to it, even though it's a third of the age. It doesn't, I'm not, this is not an argument for better or worse. No. It's just, you so know, you're saying it's because it, it, the Scotch barrels were, were, were used. Correct. Yeah. Yep. There you go. But you're you're not, you're not saying that my 
Aberfeldy. You're not saying my Aberfeldy is like a like a, a second round coffee grounds. No, no, that's just an example <laughs> on the color and the. <laughs> um, I, got, I got an analogy, but. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Well, if anybody's watching and you want to know more about whiskey, look, you can look up Kip's stuff. He just wrote a book. Um, sweet, sweet drams are made of these, right? Is that the, yes, I actually have your book somewhere, but yes, it, that's it, educational history, man. I learned something every time. That was something I didn't know what you just shared there. So it's yeah. cool, man. And you, you well, have like a channel. About, yeah. Oops. Sorry. I was going to say the fun oh, part about the whiskey book. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have, so the fun part about the whiskey, I'll just kind of give a, I'm not, not very good at this, but I'll give a plug is even though it's about whiskey, it's really about history. So it's not about brands and stuff like that necessarily. It's, it's a history book. Right. So I'm a history book. Uh, but the other thing is, is some of my personal story and definitely my faith walk are integrated into the entire thing. Uh, there's gospel there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because that's exactly. who I am because they're not, it's not like, you know, there's not, two parts of me yes i like whiskey but i also like jesus and so to me they go together and if i'm doing a, a podcast or if i'm behind a pulpit i may talk about a whiskey and a cigar but when i'm giving a tour to a bunch of people at the distillery i'm going to talk about god it just happens yeah. that's just the way it is. so that's kind of one of the unique things i like about the book is that you know my story and the faith is kind of there and there's some gospel presented to in there but anyway, yeah, so I run, again, I'm not very good at this stuff, but I do run two channels, kind of one that's more whiskey centric, uh, where I do reviews and, and just fun stuff like that. We'll do some history stuff as well on the YouTube, but across all like YouTube, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and, and um, TikTok, it's whiskey tour guide. And then for uh, more of the faith based stuff, um, like more of what we've talked about tonight, uh, it's called uh, the Happy Reformers, uh, and I think one of them doesn't have the S. It's a Reformer because of length of <laughs> the, the characters or whatever. But yeah, Happy Reformer. Uh, the Happy Reformers uh, is the, uh, the the channel on the rest of those uh, that we do stuff. We did uh, on the YouTube, which is fairly new channel. I don't have a lot on there, uh, but I did a full Advent series uh, this past December. Yes. Every day, every day of Advent. Yeah. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to do one on the creed coming up pretty soon and just kind of tear on. apart, tear, just kind of line by line on the, on the creed and, and do that. Ooh. So we believe in God, the father, right. Almighty. <laughs> Fatherhood yeah. right away. That's yeah. right. Anyway, and Jesus, so very God, of very God. <laughs> Woo. Dank stuff, bro. Well, thanks for being on, Kip. Um, really yeah. fun, man. Anytime we hang out, anytime we talk, and uh, look forward to the next time we're together. I hope uh, folks will look up some of your some of your stuff, find you on the the interwebs, or uh, or or go out and visit you. It's in uh, in Nebraska, there, man. That'd be fun. Okay. But um, yeah, nowhere. Again, bro. Uh, for everybody that's listening, glad you tuned in. Uh, if you liked it, maybe share it with a friend or post it on your social media or, or just send us a message. We, we'd love to hear from you. So thank you guys um, for the Firehouse Chronicles, for Matt and Katie. We are signing off for the night. Bless you guys. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to the Firehouse Chronicles with Matt and Katie Spinks. Check out all of the events and other grace and glory resources we've been inspired to host at thefirehouseprojects.com. There's so much brewing right now. Also, Matt and Katie do ministry full-time with the support of partners like you. So if you're blessed by our ministry, would you consider becoming a monthly partner or making a one-time donation at thefirehouseprojects.com slash donate. The more partnership we have, the more resources and nations we get to reach with this glorious good news. So thank you so much. Cheers, deep drinks, and until next time.